and peace to you, my brothers and my sisters. We greet you with the joy of Jesus on this beautiful Sunday morning, the fourth Sunday in the month of August. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. And truly, we have much to rejoice for because the Lord has been blessing, the Lord has been keeping, and the Lord has been restoring us. And so we come into the sanctuary for this morning to give God praise and to give God glory. We are still social distancing. We're not in the sanctuary. We are in our own individual homes. But we are praising God nonetheless. We are being safe. We are wearing our mask when we're going out. We are restricting uh, our going out as much as we possibly can. We are washing our hands. And we're doing everything that we can to protect ourselves and to protect others against this coronavirus. And we are trusting God to be a healer in the midst of all that we're going through. We are excited about this opportunity to worship our God and we come to worship God in spirit and in truth. All of our participants are ready. They are anointed. They are prepared. The spirit of the Lord is in this place and we come now to worship our God. Won't you go with us as we go into the sanctuary to praise and glorify God one more time.
gracious and holy Father, we come once again just to say thank you. We understand clearly it wasn't anything that we did so miraculous last night as we slumbered and slept, but because of your grace and mercy, we come this morning to say thank you. Thanking you for your darling son, Jesus the Christ, who shed his precious blood on Calvary's cross, that we wretched sinners may be saved. We thank you for the comfort that you've stationed him with us and in us. And gracious and holy Father, we come again and again to thank and praise your holy name. Right now, Father God, we bow in under submission to your will, asking if you would forgive us for all of our manifold sins by thought, word, and deed. We ask to be cast in the sea of forgiveness, never to rise anymore. Father God, in the name of Jesus, we lift your name on high. Father God, we stretch our hands and be no other help we go. If you would draw yourself from us, where would we go? Gracious and holy Father, right now we stand in the gap for this world, this country, this city, these counties, being impacted by this dreadful disease called COVID. Father God, we thank you. We trust you for it all because we understand and believe that you said you would never leave us nor forsake us. And Father God, we trust in you right now for it all. Father God, we pray for this school's beginning. Ask that you would plead the blood of Jesus over each one of those places where our children are located. Keep them so ever safe and sound. And we're going to claim victory over this disease that's called COVID. Father God, we thank you for this congregation that's called Greater Great. We thank you for the leadership that you've placed here. We ask that you continue to guide his steps with your word. Father, we bless your name this morning. We ask you to please stand by us and keep us. Please do not forsake us, Father, in the name of Jesus. We thank you again and again. And we will be so careful to give you all the honor and the praise you so richly deserve. In Jesus' name we pray, and all God's sake said, Amen. Our Old Testament scripture comes from Exodus, second chapter, verse 1 through 10. I'll be reading from the NRSV. Now a man from the house of Levi went and married a Levite woman. The woman conceived and bore a son, and when she saw that he was a fine baby, she hid him for three months. When she could hide him no longer, she got a papyrus basket for him and plastered it with butylin and pitch. She put the child in it and placed it among the neat reeds on the bank of the river. His sister stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. The daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the river. While her attendants walked beside the river, she saw the basket among the reeds and sent her maid to bring it. When she opened it, she saw the child. He was crying, and she took pity on him. This must be one of the Hebrews' children, she said. Then his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and get you a nurse from the Hebrew woman to nurse the child for you? Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Yes. So the girl went and called the child's mother. Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this child and nurse it for me, and I will give you your wages. So the woman took the child and nursed it. When the child grew up, she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, and she took him as her son. She named him Moses, because she said, I drew him out of the water. The word of God for the people of God. The New Testament scripture this morning, Matthew 16, verses 13 through 20. New Revised Standard Version. Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say the Son of Man is? And they said, Some say John the Baptist, but others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you. Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. 
And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loose in heaven. Then he sternly all the disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah.
that you are a God who is able. You are going to fulfill every promise that you have made to us. And so we come this morning standing on the promises of God. Even in the midst of this pandemic, Lord, we trust you. We trust you to be a healer. We trust you to be a deliverer. We trust you to bring us out and to make us better. Thank you now, God, for this opportunity to worship you and to come with our hearts open, our minds ready, and our eyes looking up to the hills when we've come to thy help. Speak and encourage us. Strengthen us. Empower us to endure a little while longer. Thank you for what you're about to do. And God, we give you the praise. We give you the glory. We give you the honor in advance. It is in the name of Jesus that we pray and believe it done by faith. And the people of God said, Amen. And amen. Amen. My brothers and my sisters, I want to call your attention as we uh, are in the fourth series um, of, of this series, Tackling the Unexpected Turns of Life. I want to call your attention this morning to the book of Ruth. Uh, Ruth chapter number one. I'm going to read uh, some selected verses, verses one through eight and then 14 through 16. And I'm reading from the New Revised Standard Version of the Holy Bible, Ruth, chapter number 1, beginning at verse number 1. Listen for the word of the Lord. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land, and certain a certain man of Bethlehem and Judah went to live in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife was Naomi. And the name of his two sons were Malon and Chilion. They were Ephrathites from Bethlehem in Judah. They went into the country of Moab and remained there. But Elimelech and the husband of Naomi died, and she was left with two sons. Those took Moabite wives. The name of one was Orpah, and the name of the other, Ruth. When they had lived there about ten years, both Malon and Chilion also died, so that the woman was left without her two sons and her husband. Then she started to return with her daughter-in-laws from the country of Moab, for she had heard in the country of Moab that the Lord had considered his people and given them food. So she set out from the place where she had been living, she and her daughter-in-laws, and they went on their way to go back to the land of Judah. But Naomi said to her daughter-in-laws, Go back, each of you, to your mother's house. Verse 14, Then they wept aloud again. Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. So she said, See, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her God. Return with your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, Do not press me to leave you or to turn back from following you. Where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people and your God, my God. Amen. So in his reading of the word, I want to tag this text this morning. I refuse to go back to Moab. I refuse to go back to Moab. Prior to First Lady Michelle Obama's absolute surgical evisceration of the 45th President of the United States on Tuesday night, she had previously stated during her weekly podcast that she had been suffering from a form of low-grade depression. Describing the times we are currently living as not being fulfilling times, Ms. Obama attributed what she self-diagnosed as a low-grade depression to a combination of the isolation resulting from COVID-19, the refusal of some people to adopt common sense practices such as wearing a mask, the racial strife and divide experienced across the country, 
and the frustration affiliated with observing the hypocrisy of the current administration on a day in and day out basis. Clinical psychologists immediately chimed in following Mrs. Obama's admission to underscore that the fact that the possibility of a low-grade depression may be more commonplace occurrence across the country than most people are aware. Mental clinicians define low-grade depression as a periodic sadness, a loss of interest in activity, difficulty concentrating, sleeping, appetite disturbances, irritability, or as Mrs. Obama described, a sense of heaviness or repeated episode of waking up in the middle of the night because I'm troubled about the events of the past day. Uh, based on the opinion of mental clinicians, mental clinicians who stated that the difference between a low-grade depression and clinical depression is grounded in the short-term nature of the condition and the fact that only one or more symptoms is necessary for the diagnosis. I possibly could join Ms. O Mrs. Obama in confessing my own periodic experiences with low-grade depression. Uh, I would, however, attribute the heaviness that I periodically have experienced to what I describe as a spirit of death that seems to be hovering over our country for the past eight months. Statistics reveal that on average, 2.5 million people die every year in the United States from a variety of causes, but since February the 6th, more than 175,000 people have died from COVID-19 alone, which appears to exacerbate, which is already a difficult crisis. Uh, back in March 2020, when we initially began to social distance and worship through technological means, very few of us knew or were, re or were related to people who had contracted the virus, and most certainly those who had died from it were people that lived in far off places, distance from the protective comforts of our own home and our cities. However, over the course of the past few months, this horrific virus has come home and virtually all of us can give a testimony about family members and loved ones who have been affected or who have died from this virus. And to complicate things even further, hospital protocols that have been established to prevent the spread of the virus and protect essential medical workers and staff uh, relegate those who have contracted the virus to isolation away from their families and loved ones, resulting in the unmerciful and heartless reality of the one who has been affected both suffering and dying all alone. Uh, constant stories have been shared by husbands and wives, fathers and mothers, sisters and brothers about loved ones who have gone into the hospital and who have never been seen again until their bodies were claimed after being released by hospital personnel. Uh, the overwhelming reality of the impact of this virus has had uh, on the everyday life of individuals throughout this country and the world is enough to cause anyone of us to suffer a low-grade depression. Uh, the grief and the sorrow that is affiliated with the loss of a loved one is traumatic in and of itself. And the truth of the matter is that no matter how prepared you might have thought you were for the imminent death of a loved one, no one is actually prepared when the person that you love actually dies. Uh, the author C.S. Lewis once wrote, uh, talking about grief, that no one ever told me that grief felt so much like fear. I am not afraid, but the sensation is like being afraid. Uh, the same fluttering of the stomach, the same restlessness, the same yawning, and the reflex of continuing swallowing. Uh, he goes on to say that, that at other times it feels like being mildly drunk or concussed. There is a sort of invisible blanket between the world and me. I find it hard to take in what anyone says, or perhaps hard to even want to take it in. Uh, it is so interesting, anything that someone says to me, because I want people to be concerned and to talk to me, but at the same time, I don't want to be bothered by anyone. Uh, Lewis' description of his grief may be familiar to some of you who, 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 who most of us have come to the understanding that just dealing with death of a loved one in and of itself is an emotional and a physical taxing experience. 
And to further complicate it, the normal difficulties of grief and sadness with the mister, mysterious virus uh, of which the extent of its transmission is still uncertain and the effects that it has on the human body is still being studied and discovered and the rate in which it takes one life of one person opposed to the life of another person baffle, baffle even the most trained scientific minds is again enough to cause anybody to have a low-grade depression. Uh, and so in an effort to speak to the reality of a potential low-grade depression that we all may either be consciously or subconsciously experiencing, we are drawn again to the Word of God, uh, which uh, we have discovered is timeless in its application of ancient biblical principles to our contemporary life experiences. For the book of Ruth is a remarkable story that provides relevant parallels to our contemporary context and helps us to confront our existential bout with depression and anxiety through the lens of an overcomer. Uh, the book of Ruth is one of the shortest books of the Bible with just four chapters. It is situated between the book of Judges and 1 Samuel in the Old Testament and is alleged to have been authored by the same prophet by the name of Samuel. Uh, the book is remarkably relevant considering we are currently commemorating the 100 years uh, since the enactment of the 19th Amendment to the Constitution which gave women Women the right to vote and the historic nomination of Kamala Harris, uh, Sister Kamala Harris, Senator Kamala Harris as the vice presidential candidate for the Democratic Party. The Book of Ruth provides uh, concrete evidence of the historical reality of the strength of women to persevere and overcome in the midst of overwhelming odds down throughout the annals of time. Uh, we are engaged by the writer of this book uh, as we first learn uh, of this encounter of this family, this family that is in the midst of a family. Uh, we see that in verse 1 that this family is in the midst of a family. For verse 1 says, in the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. Uh, the land, the land referred to is the land of Bethlehem of Judah, where uh, an Israelite by the name of Elimelech and his wife Naomi and their two sons uh, once lived. But just as we see people standing in food lines today because of the inability to feed themselves due to the economic crisis caused by the mismanagement of the response to COVID-19, the famine in Judah caused a severe shortage of food in a likewise manner. Therefore, Elimelech and Naomi decided that they would venture to a land where they believed they would be able to provide for their family. Uh, so the four of them, they traveled to Moab, which is situated on the highest plateau east of the Dead Sea between Edom and Ammon. I would suggest to us the necessity of knowing our history uh, because Moab was a place where Moses had died before the children of Israel had come across the Jordan into the promised land. Now, and if I might suggest this simple thing to you, uh, that if God brings you out of Moab, don't go back. Uh, that, that'll preach all by itself. Joshua chapter number one, God said to Joshua, uh, you and these people have been sitting here on the plains of, of Moab, mourning the death of Moses too long. Arise up, cross over this Jordan, and every place where your foot shall trod, I'm going to give it to you. Now, when God has delivered you from Moab, don't go back. When God has brought you out of Moab, don't go back. When God has brought you out of your old way of living, don't go back. Don't go back to people that God has delivered you from. Don't go back to the old hangouts that once kept you in bondage. When God has brought you out of Moab, stay out of Moab. Stay out, stay out, stay out of Moab, stay out of Moab. This family is in the midst of famine and, and they decide to go back to Moab. And then we find in verse number three, the family is suffering through grief. Uh, verse number three tells us that while the four of them were there in Moab, Elimelech, the husband, dies. Uh, there are no details about what caused his death. The Bible does not suggest to us whether he was sick or suffered an accident or whether he was killed. It simply says, Elimelech, Naomi's husband died. Uh, the family finds themselves away from the familiarity of the land they originated in. They are in a strange land surrounded by unfamiliar people, unfamiliar customs and traditions. And in the midst of these unfamiliar conditions, uh, the patriarch, the provider, and the parental figurehead of the family dies. 
uh, leaving the family to struggle for survival in Moab. This family found themselves suffering through their grief, uh, grieving the loss of the head of the family, grieving the loss uh, of the family's stability, grieving of the fact that they are now left in a vulnerable situation. In the land of Moab, this family is suffering through their grief. Uh, and as I said earlier, grief is something that is common to all of us in this human experience. But can I tell you that the old saints used to say, uh, when, when, when they coined the phrase, when it rains, it pours. Uh, because not only is this family suffering through grief, but then we discover this family's grief is even complicated. Uh, uh, for verse number 4 and 5 describes to us uh, that as the two sons... Uh, Malon and Chilion married two women of Moab, Ruth and Orpah, uh, and they dwelt together for about 10 years. Uh, but again, we see the, 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 the devastating occurrence uh, of the family's misfortune in chapter number 5, or verse number 5, uh, for it said, these two sons died also. Naomi, who has come to Moab in search of food with her husband and her two sons, is now left only with her two daughter-in-laws. Uh, one of the things that I have discovered uh, in pastoring is that uh, it is generally not useful uh, and may even be even damaging to tell someone uh, who is grieving, I know how you feel. Uh, the truth of the matter is, is that uh, everyone's grief is different, and as a result, you really don't know how anyone else feels uh, because we all process our grief differently. Uh, but in the case of Naomi, who is in uh, the span of 10 years, has lost her husband and her two sons in a strange place away from her homeland, I can say, say without a shadow of a doubt, I really don't know how she feels. I don't know. I don't know what she's experiencing. I don't know whether she has a feeling of doubt or desperation. I don't know if she's going through angst, anxiety, or anguish, hurt, heartbreak, or hopelessness. Uh, considering the chains of events that have befallen her family, she may even be suffering from a low-grade depression. Uh, because this family has seen their grief uh, uh, come upon them, and now their grief has been compounded by the circumstances of life. Uh, but the text, the text uh, then it suggests to us the resilience in the spirit of Naomi uh, because it indicates to us that then she begins uh, to attempt to figure a way out. Uh, this family, this family is now attempting to figure a way forward. Uh, I certainly have uh, no expertise in the field of psychology, but based on my lived experiences, I would offer to you that one of the most positive things you can do to combat a bout of any type of depression is to keep moving forward. Uh, you got to avoid getting stuck in complacency and keep moving forward. Not allow yourself to wallow in pity or self-doubt, but you got to get up and move forward. Uh, someone, uh, sometimes the time uh, may not even be clear, the way not even, may not even be clear, uh, but you've got to keep moving forward. Uh, between verses 6 and 14, Naomi and her two daughter-in-laws, uh, 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 they attempt to move forward. Naomi hears that God has blessed the land of Judah, and there is now food in the land, and she makes up her mind to return to her homeland. Uh, she's going back without the covering of her husband and her sons, uh, but it is the land of familiarity. Uh, Judah is the land of her family because her husband's people are still there. Uh, Judah is the land that holds their future because surely they have only experienced death and devastation in the land of Moab. And so Naomi resolves uh, in herself to return to the land of Judah and then she makes it up in her mind what appears to be a common sense suggestion. She advises her daughter-in-laws to return to their families in Moab. Uh, these Moabite women have married Israelite men who have died and left them widows. And the common sense thing to do is to return to the covering of your father's house. Uh, these women obviously have formed a bond with their mother-in-law and are reluctant to part ways with her. But verse number 14 indicates that after several tearful exchanges, Orpah decides to go back to her people and back to her home. Uh, but the B clause, the B clause of the text says that Ruth clung to Naomi. Uh, Ruth, Ruth committed herself to stay with her mother in law and uttered a profound statement that demonstrated her dedication and devotion to the one uh, that she had developed this deep seated love for. Naomi said to Ruth, uh, uh, Look, your sister has gone back to her people and to her God, return as your sister has. But Ruth replied to Naomi, Don't press 
asking me to leave you or turn back from following you. Because where you go, I'm going to go. Uh, where uh, you lodge, I'm going to lodge. Uh, your people are going to be my people and your God shall be my God. They're, 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 they're very uh, sincere words of affirmation uh, for the feeling that Ruth uh, had for Naomi and suggest several things to us uh, as we're dealing with the grief uh, that is inherent in the loss that we have experienced and the loss that we see all around the country as we deal with COVID-19. Uh, the first thing, first thing that the text suggests to us is that Ruth saw purpose beyond the death of her loved one. Uh, Ruth understood uh, that she and her husband had been brought together uh, and started a life as a family, but uh, it was ended prematurely by his untimely death. Uh, but she resolved in herself uh, that the fact that the death did not equate to her death, uh, his death did not equate to her death, uh, that she was still alive, and as long as she had breath in her body, she still had purpose. A phrase that I've heard some people say uh, in the midst of grief is, I don't know how I can go on without them. Uh, and the truth of the matter is, is that you really don't know how you can go on without them. But can I tell you, you can go on. Uh, as long as you've got breath in your body, you can go on. As long as the Lord is opening up your eyes every day to a brand new day and giving you new mercies, uh, you can go on. The mere fact uh, that the Lord didn't allow you to die with your loved one suggests that the Lord wants you to go on. Uh, Ruth, Ruth resolved herself to the fact that she still had purpose. She still had value. Uh, she still had worth. She embraces the notion that I shall live and I shall not die because I'm going to go on because I've still got life. She had purpose beyond uh, the death of her loved one. But then number two, she saw the potential uh, in the continuation of the covenant relationship. Uh, the book of Ruth uh, is much like the book of Esther in which there is no reference to the name of God, but the providence of God is woven throughout every chapter. Uh, Ruth, Ruth must have sensed that there was a divine reason for Naomi uh, and her husband and her sons traveling from Judah to Moab. Uh, there was a divine reason that she uh, and her sisters were drawn to them and ultimately united in marriage. There had to be a divine reason uh, why all of the men of that family's lives uh, had been taken suddenly she didn't understand it uh, but she must have believed there was a divine reason why her sister Orpah had relented and returned back home there had to be a divine reason why something inside of her would not let uh, Naomi go there, there was a divine reason she told Naomi don't press me to leave you uh, don't prevent me from following you there, there is potential in continuing with you in this relationship that we have developed because it is a covenant relationship. Uh, Ruth and her sister had a blood relationship, but sometimes covenant relationships are stronger than blood relationships. Uh, Ruth had known her sister all her life, but it is the covenant relationship with Naomi uh, that has been formed by marriage that Ruth uh, is still compelled uh, to urge and to maintain. Uh, I, I'm not sure, I'm not sure if, if she even knew why, but, but she uttered the declaration uh, that wherever you go, I'm going to go. Where, wherever you lodge, I'm going to lodge. Wherever your people are, those are going to be my people because a blood relationship are by birth, but covenant relationship are by choice. Uh, something, something inside you lets you know that your destiny is tied up in the relationship of somebody else. Your future is connected with the relationship of somebody else. Wherever your purpose is of life, it is grounded in continuing the relationship that you have with that covenant individual. Uh, she saw she saw the potential in continuing her covenant relationship with Naomi. I, I, Naomi, I know Naomi uh, may, may not desire to ever be married again, but I need to keep my relationship. I understand uh, that it's virtually impossible for her to have another child uh, and to fulfill the role as my previous husband did, but I, I need to keep my relationship with her. I know uh, that she is returning to a land that's uh, familiar to her, but foreign to me. Uh, but I believe my destiny is connected in my covenant relationship with her. Uh, and and not, not, not the blood relationship that I have back in Moab. I, I declare right now that I'm not going to go back to Moab. I'm not going to go back to the place where I, I came because I, I see my future ahead with my covenant relationship. Last thing, last thing I want to suggest to you uh, that she, she saw 
her connection uh, in, in that covenant relationship uh, because the power of the true God had been revealed through her. Uh, as I said, like, like, like Esther, uh, uh, the name of God is, is not prominent in this book called Ruth. Uh, but there is evidence that Naomi uh, has shared some testimonies with Ruth about the true and the living God. Uh, in verse number 8 through 15, Naomi pleads with Ruth to return uh, to the familiar surroundings of her family and to her people. Uh, she prophesied uh, to her that a future husband could even be waiting back in the land from which she came. Uh, then in verse number 15, she appeals to her. She said, look, your sister uh, has gone back to her people and to her God. Uh, why don't you do the same thing? Why don't you pick up uh, all of your belongings and go back with your sister to the familiar confines of your family? But Ruth counters and said, don't press me too hard. Uh, I don't want to leave you. She said, don't, 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 don't make me turn back from following you because wherever you go, I'm going to go. Wherever you lodge, I'm going to, I'm going to lodge. Your, your people are going to be my people uh, and your God is going to be my, my God. Bible, Bible readers will know that when Naomi uh, encourages Ruth uh, to return uh, with her sister, uh, she says go back, go back with your sister to your land, to your home, and to your God. Uh, read it for yourself, Bible readers, when she says go back uh, to your God, she uses the small g for God. Uh, that is suggest that, is suggest that the God of Ruth uh, is one of many gods. Uh, the God of Ruth is an inferior God. The, God. the God of Ruth is an idol God, not a real God at all. It is a powerless God. But when, when Ruth responds to Naomi, Ruth says, where you go, I'll go. When you lodge, our Lord, your people shall be my people, and your God shall be my God. In, in referencing the God of Naomi, Ruth uses the capital G, uh, not, not the small G for God. This, this suggests uh, that she's come into the knowledge of the God. Uh, not, not a God, but, but the God that somewhere uh, in the discussions with her mother-in-law, uh, she has been told about the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Naomi uh, has shared some stories about the God of all creation. Uh, I don't know how it may have happened, but somewhere within the 10 years in which they were together, uh, she told her about the almighty God, the capital G God, the God that steps out into nothing and speaks and creates all things to God uh, that can divide the mighty waters of an ocean and a sea to God that holds back the jaws of a hungry lion. She must have shared with Ruth the story about the God that can do all things to God, the God uh, that can make all things possible. Uh, for this is the God that Ruth said, uh, now shall be my God, no matter what state uh, uh, of condition she finds herself in, she believes that God is able to do everything that he said he would do. Uh, he's going to fulfill uh, every promise that he made uh, to you. Uh, I, I believe that she said in her heart, don't give up on God because I believe that he won't give up on me. He is a God that can make all things possible. He's a God that can turn situations around. I heard you talk about your God and how he made ways out of no ways. You've been walking and teaching me for 10 years. And even though you lost your husband and we've lost our husband, your two sons, and all it is in you and I, I'm going to go wherever you go. I'm going to trust and you trust. Wherever you can, I'm going to can. Wherever you lodge, I'm going to lodge. Because I heard about the big G God that can do all things. So I'm going to go where you go. Believing the God can make a way. I come to declare right now that I refuse to go
and his way in my life. Lift up your head, O ye gates, and be ye lifted up, ye everlasting doors. And the King of glory, he shall come in. This is a difficult time that we're living in. I, I know, I know, I know I'm right about this. Practically every one of us, I hear it on the prayer line. I hear it from testimonies from the members, from my friends. All of us, all of us are experiencing this phenomenon of death that is passing over our country even passing over our world. All of us know people who are affected by this virus and those who are dying by all of the other causes by which the Lord draws us to Him. It can be depressing. It can give us not only a low grade, it can give us a high level of depression. If we try to handle it on our own, but Naomi, Naomi said, Naomi, Naomi said, Ruth, go back, go back, go back, go back to where you came. But Ruth said, no, I, I found something. I found something in our relationship with you. You've given me, you've given me inspiration. I know the big G God, not the little G God. I know a God that can make ways out of no ways. I know a God that can encourage my heart, that can strengthen me, that can carry me through the difficult times of life. Amen. You can't go back to Moab, the place of defeat, the place of doubt, the place of disaster, even the place of death, because our God is a God of life. As a matter of fact, he said, whoever should believe in me, though they were dead, yet shall they live. And anyone who liveth and believeth in me shall never die. In other words, you just pass from life to greater life. Don't you, don't you want that kind of life? Don't you want to have that kind of relationship? I, I come today, I come today um, to extend an invitation that there may be someone going through your own grief, going through your own situation. Your head is hung down. You may even be going through a bout of depression. I come to say, lift up your hands, lift up your hand, extend your hand towards me, and just say this simple prayer, Lord, I confess my sin, for I am a sinner, but I believe the blood of Jesus shed for me, washes me clean, I believe it in my heart, I confess it with my mind, that he died, and he now lives for me, and I declare that I want to live for in Jesus' name, amen. If you said that very, very simple prayer, my brothers and sisters, you are saved. The uh, book of Romans chapter number 10 uh, declares it to us that it's just that simple. Uh, but, but as we discovered uh, in, in our church school lesson last week, faith without works is dead. There has to be a corresponding action to your salvation. Uh, you have to come, you have to get in a good church. Bible-believing church, a loving church, where people can love on you and help to teach you and groom you and help you to grow in your walk with the Lord. I declare right now that this great grand church is a church uh, just what you're looking for. Some beautiful, loving people, kind spirits, graciousness, generosity, and, and you're just what we're looking for as well. Won't you come and join us? You see the number of the church and the address scrolling on the bottom of the screen. Call us. We would love to have a conversation with you, pray with you, and to receive you uh, into the membership, into the flock of the Greater Grant Church. And I would be so proud uh, to be called your pastor. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you, all of our viewers, uh, by way of all the technological uh, platforms out there. We are thankful for your, your, your generosity and your giving. Truly. You all have just been so uh, 
generous in your giving, helping this church to meet all of its obligations and continue ministry in the midst of this pandemic. I want to give you an opportunity to give one more time. Uh, as a matter of fact, I want you to make an investment in this ministry because uh, the idea of an investment means that you get a return on your investment. Uh, you see the various ways of giving. You can uh, give by way of our mobile app, Give Plus. Uh, you can write a check and, and mail it to the church or drop it in the mailbox. Uh, amen. Or you can meet the finance team here on Tuesdays and Fridays uh, to give your offering to them. Amen. We're so thankful for all that we have heard, all we have seen from the Spirit of God that's been in this place. Want to uh, continue to pray for all of our uh, families who are going through bereavement. We want you to lift up the Brown family, Mrs. Mildred Brown, uh, whose life we celebrated on Wednesday, Sister Larice Postel, uh, whose sister will be celebrated uh, this week, Sister Tamiko Green, whose uh, father uh, was celebrated on a Friday, uh, Sister Gladys McNeil, whose aunt passed, and Sister Mercil Demps, who Brother Julius Demps went to be with the Lord uh, on Monday. Um, please pray for that family, and you'll be hearing more about the arrangements to come. Amen. As a matter of fact, let's just do this. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for grace, for mercy, and for kindness, and we pray a covering. Uh, we pray, God, a strong arm of protection, comfort for all of these families whose names we call and those whose names we don't know to call. Lift up their head, O oh God, and encourage them in the midst of their grief and their tears. And let them know, God, that not only earth has no sorrow, that heaven cannot heal, but we believe to be absent with, from the body is to be present with the Lord. So we believe their souls are resting with you. So peace now, comfort, strength, joy to the families as they go in these days to come, yet without their loved ones. Speak to them. Let them know that you'll never leave them nor forsake them. In the name of Jesus we pray. And the people of God said, Amen. Amen. God bless you, my brothers and my sisters. Thank you all so much. Until we meet again on next Sunday, may the peace of the Lord be with you.